That's in itself a little story there. Um, welcome here at uh, the fifth State of the Internet lecture. Uh, on behalf of um, Single Uitgeverijen, SDN Fund, de Gemeente Amsterdam, de Groene Amsterdammer en de OBA en de Waag. We welcome you here. Uh, my name is Marleen Sticker, I'm founder of Waag. And I'm really happy to have this huge audience. Uh, that must be I think it must be for James, definitely. You all come from for their story. But uh, it's also because it's the fifth, of course, we have an anniversary. And the, 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 the audience is building up uh, every year. So thank you for being here. Uh, the state of the internet, it's uh, one moment in the year that, well, I think we are doing it all the time, but this is a moment to reflect on where are we? What, are, what is at stake? And uh, the first, edition was by Jose van Dijk, Professor of Media and Digital Society at the University of Utrecht. And she zoomed in in the role of platforms in public space. Uh, the year after, Jaap Henk Hoekman, he's an expert in the field of privacy by design, he discussed our digital identity. Um, in 2021, Senai Gabriel, he is uh, from the University of Amsterdam on neuroinformatician. Uh, neuro wow, that's a really great title. Uh, he, investi he investigating, is, is, is investigating algorithmic injustice and other potential dangers of smart and machine learning systems. And last year, Nani Janssen Rivendlof was talking about, she's a human rights lawyer, was talking about what is needed to have a fair and just future um, um, and what is needed on the internet to, to come to that moment. But today, we're going even a step further because a lot of people, I think one of the if we, we're not talking about blockchain anymore, we do, now we're talking all about AI. And it's, it's, it's all over the place. Um, luckily, it's, we're not talking about the metaverse. I think that is already gone, that whole topic. <laughs> but we're talking about AI now. And um, again, I think a lot of, there's a lot of mystification about the terminology. Um, there's a lot of well, thinking like what it could happen to us. And there's utopian, the dystopian futures being presented to us. Um, but the real question is, and I think this is what we're going to discuss today, if there's artificial intelligence, what do we mean by intelligence? Um, and we sort of, sort of, it's, it's a story that we, that we tell each other, but we have not really a clue. And I think we're at a moment in time that a lot of different um, scientists, artists, um, people from different backgrounds are trying to understand the world in a different way. And if it's post-human or not human-centered, or there are a lot of beautiful uh, terminology for that. Uh, but the person that definitely helps us to, to understand uh, what is happening and can sort of set the scenery for us is James Bridle. Uh, James is here to uh, present the book, Ways of Being. It's published uh, in 2022, and I think today or yesterday, the Dutch translation is there. And I think you're on a tour in Europe. I think also the German translation is there. So it's a book which can have a lot of impact. And a lot of people are very interested in this story. Ways of being, it's about other intelligences. It's, it's not thinking about one which is def defining it, but opening ourselves to other types of intelligence. Um, James work, works uh, as a writer, an artist, journalist, and technologist. He 
uh, their artworks have been commissioned by galleries and institutions and, and has been exhibited worldwide. Bridal writes about literature, culture and networks and has been published in magazines and newspapers, including Wired, The Atlantic, uh, The New Statesman, The Guardian and The Financial Times. So today, the keynote will be on other intelligences. James will explore the current state of artificial intelligence, where it's headed, and how we might think otherwise about artificial intelligence and the multiple other forms of intelligence that exist in the world. James, please take the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have the clicker? That would help. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening. Thank you very, very much uh, for having me. Thank you uh, to the organizers. Uh, thank you all for coming out on this quite grim night. And uh, thank you for that amazing introductory video, which I'm going to want to rewatch again later. Um, so yeah, I, this evening I'm going to talk about other intelligences. And we'll see if we can figure out what that means. Um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about, given the kind of larger theme of this series, the current state of the internet and particularly of AI. Um, and then I'm going to question a little bit of some of the assumptions that underlie the I, the, the, the assumptions around intelligence that make up part of artificial intelligence and really of our conceptions of intelligence in general. Um, and then I will use those ideas to play with some ideas around technology a bit to look at how we might reconfigure or at least make clear what is possible in the reconfiguring um, by taking some of those lessons of intelligence a bit further. Maybe that will become clear. Um, I wanted to start by talking about the way in which intelligence, or at least our thinking, has uh, changed, particularly over the course of the 20th century, and particularly since the invention of computation um, in the kind of 1940s and 1950s, something very strange happened to our idea of, of, of thinking, really, uh, which is that we, we discovered this really, really powerful way of encoding certain kinds of thoughts into ones and zeros, uh, into, and then feeding those into machines that were capable of performing certain types of calculations and so, uh, solving certain types of problems based on those. Problems that were really, felt really big, like predicting the weather or building atomic bombs or managing society on quite a large scale. Uh, but those computers became so powerful that we kind of took their abilities for thinking itself. We kind of we were so impressed and wowed by these machines that we've come to kind of mistake computation for the act of thought itself. I, I tend to call this computational thinking. Uh, we came to think like computers ourselves, and we start to lose sight of things which cannot be computed, things that don't lend themselves to being compressed into ones and zeros, things that don't fall naturally into binaries, things that don't fall naturally into hierarchies, they don't fit well inside these machines, and so they tend to be either ignored or suppressed. And that has led to a huge problem for us, um, because we've kind of come to see the whole world only in terms of what is computable. It's become essentially the limits to how we can think about the world. Um, of course, there's so much in the world that is, is not computable. Um, but this, because this has become the kind of dominant paradigm of how we think, it's become so incredibly hard to think outside that. Um, it's really you know, become very subconsciously the, the way in which not just society operates, but really the way we, we think of how it should, um, uh, according to a, a kind of system of, of, of ideas, laws, methods that extend back further, particularly you know, um, kind of 17th and 18th century enlightenments. Um, they're promulgated by the kind of Western dominant science. But then when they got encoded into these machines, they became, as I say, kind of the way that we think, because they're the way we model and represent the world. They're the model we have for kind of manipulating the world and doing anything with it, right? And so if we can't force it into those machines, we can't figure out the ways to do anything about it. And in fact, it's kind of got to the point now, it feels like where there's this idea that the world itself is like a computer, that the world itself is some kind of program that's running 
um, and that if we could only kind of figure out the laws of that program in some kind of way, if we could only, um, you know, like adjust, constantly optimize various complex systems, better fit that program, those complex systems better fit that program, we'd be able to kind of manage the world in that way. Um, but this isn't the case. The world is not like a computer. We are capable of thinking thoughts outside binary terms. Um, um, but the, and we're aware, I think, deeply, subconsciously, unconsciously, only occasionally consciously, of how badly fitted those things are. That we live inside a, a, a society, a civilization, and a world that is running on principles that don't match reality. Uh, that something has gone deeply amiss. And when you marry that, of course, to the general state of things, uh, the, the collapse of ecosystems, uh, the fracturing in our politics, uh, and, and much, much else, um, I see those kind of feelings as actually kind of the producing much of the dominant tenor of the world today. There is this belief, right, that more and more data, more and more information would bring us all together into some kind of collective state of agreement. That was, that was the thing, that there, there is some kind of one great truth at the end of all of this calculation at which point we'll all kind of agree and we'll all get on. That was the promise of computation, promise of the internet. It's the, it's the promise of the enlightenment. And that's really not what's happened, is it, right? We find ourselves in a situation of uh, incredible kind of schism, um, increasing divisions within populations, increased disagreements, and particularly increased fundamentalisms. Instead of all kind of coming together at the center, or, or at least coming together somewhere, right? Uh, everyone goes to the margins, and those margins seem to hate each other. And the dominant tenor is this kind of rage and fear and uncertainty that's brought on by the un inability to match what is happening within our machines and, and that everything we're told and everything that's predicted with the state of the world as it actually is. And of course, that computational system, which is also a system of, of thinking, of cognition, is, is, is damaging the Earth itself even further. So it's, this whole process is a disaster for us and our societies. It's also a disaster for the planet that we are a part of. Um, just the use of computers in general, the tools that we use to do all that thinking, um, cause about 5% of um, uh, CO2 uh, emissions. They have this, the, the internet has about the same uh, CO2 footprint as the airline industry. Um, uh, and that's only increasing with uh, the kind of advancement of our tools. So all of the hot new technologies you hear about, um, whether that's kind of blockchain, NFT type things we heard about in the introduction, whether it's AI, uh, the main characteristic of those things is that they run faster and hotter than previous technologies. Um, so AI, this thing that we're all hearing so much about that's supposed to be really, really intelligent, uh, is basically a product of burning ever more fossil fuels. Um, it has a, a vast, vast footprint. Uh, it's about the most processor-intensive like, work you can do, uh, which obviously also makes it like the stupidest possible thing we could be doing in the present moment. And it's in these kind of weird mismatches between what is called intelligence and what is obviously a dumb thing to do that I find something really powerful to explore about why it is we're like, obsessed with building the things that we're building. There's one really important point to make about when you hear all of this chatter about AI in the present moment, um, which is that it is not like new or revolutionary, what anyone tells you. Um, there's been no like major scientific technical advances in AI in the, the last 20 years. Uh, we're still using the kind of neural network models that you might have heard about. These kind of um, models of like very simplified, abstracted ideas of how a uh, brain might function the neural network model, hasn't really changed very much in 20 years. What's changed is um, the, uh, the availability of huge amounts of processing power, bigger, faster computers, owned by very large corporations, uh, and of huge amounts of data. All of our lives sucked into those machines, owned by Google and Facebook and others, uh, that they churn through with their huge data centers to produce what they call AI. That is AI in the present moment. It's just a huge, huge land grab of all of our histories and memories and dreams sucked into these machines and kind of given back to us as like, wow, isn't this chatbot cool? Um, it's, it is what it is. Um, but, <laughs> but it reveals something so amazing about like what those kind of dominant dreams 
of, of corporations and so sections of society actually look like. Um, this is uh, Lisa Doll, the um, Korean Go grandmaster, who famously was beaten um, at his favorite game by a computer designed explicitly to beat him, which always seems mean. Um, uh, by Google's AlphaGo, DeepMind's AlphaGo. Um, there's a reason that, until recently, all the AI stories you heard about were about people being beaten at board games um, uh, and other forms of kind of competitive play. And it's actually related to the current one. Um, it's because the only vision of intelligence that these corporations who are developing have is a competitive one, right? It, it, it comes out of the models as well. These neural network models advance really quickly when they're basically taught to fight each other. Um, but, but the intelligence that is at work here, the intelligence at work in contemporary AI, because the only people who can make contemporary AI, remember, are people with huge amounts of money, really big computers, and access to all of your personal data, um, are huge profit-seeking corporations. Um, uh, and so the logic of contemporary AI what that AI thinks is intelligent is, is corporate capitalism, is, is the um, win at all costs, um, you know, beat the opposition down, clear the field for oneself, ac acquire as much, uh, extract as much. Um, just a really horrible kind of intelligence, right? <laughs> like, we all know people like that. Uh, they read, you know, uh, Sun Tzu and Machiavelli and think that that is like the way to get on in life. And it is one way to get on in life, but it's not the only thing you want in town. Um, and so this, this very narrow view of what intelligence is has come to dominate. And, and it's the reason they're now going for the chatbots and the image generators is because they've decided, like, that's the next thing we can basically move into. Oh, artists, they don't work very hard, do they? We can, like... Uh, we can slide into that um, because we've mastered like the numbers game, and now we're going to do the creative game. And they'll keep moving up because they want to take this territory. Companies will company, but it would be a real shame if they won the battle to define what intelligence is in the present moment, right? Because there are so many other ways to think. And actually, what we should really take from this story is not just that, yes, AI is recapitulating all of the kind of former ways in which large companies try to make all of the money and dominate the world, um, but that it's revealing something actually much more interesting, which is that machine intelligence, whatever it is, is not like human intelligence. Because actually, what it turns out what these AIs are doing, like, there's always that weird bit, right? There's always that weird thing, that you, it's the uncanny bit within it where you're like, this is not... This is doing something non-human. This is doing something other than interesting. And there's way more interesting experiments than beating us at board games and making up images and chatbots. Um, where it proves itself capable. Um, scientific experiments where AIs are capable of um, uh, in, like exploring the, the ways, new ways in which you can fold proteins for medicines and so on and so forth. They're capable of solving genuinely novel problems that humans are terrible at. But they do it in fundamentally different ways to the human. And actually, what's super interesting about that, and should be really commented on, should be there, is that there's another kind of intelligence at work here, a non-human kind of intelligence. And the thing about non-human intelligence is, well, the, the dream of AI was always the science fiction dream, that it would be this kind of superhuman AI, right? That because we, we're incapable of imagining intelligence as something different to human intelligence. We have a very long history of doing that. But at the same time, as we're fascinated at the moment with all of this talk about AI, the, the sciences, biological sciences, behavioral sciences, are, have been revealing over the last kind of couple of decades the really extraordinary breadth of non-human intelligences that are all around us. And it remains fascinating to me that it's in this particular moment, this fascination with AI, that all these other kind of intelligences are becoming clear to us. Um, the reason I think we have struggle with this idea of AI, why we, we keep assuming that these weird little number crunching machines are going to come and sort of take over the world because they resemble human intelligence. It's because we're incapable of thinking clearly about other forms of intelligence, as I said, and we've been doing this for a very long time. Um, if you look at the ways in which humans describe intelligence, even in the literature, the, the, the descriptions of intelligence, you can pick all of these things like a, um, 
planning, um, like state uh, self-awareness, uh, being able to kind of predict the future, being able to act on others' intentions, um, uh, the whole grab bag of qualities. But all of them are really like what humans do, right? And so that's how we've always treated other species. That's how we've always looked at other species and said, hey, um, like, can you do what we do? And tested them on those grounds. And this is incredibly revealing of our idea of what intelligence is. Um, because it, like, we basically create this kind of line in the sand and say, like, can you cross this line in this test? And then, OK, we'll like, consider you to be intelligent in some particular way. Um, uh, my friend, the Gibbon, gives a really good example of why this has been mistaken, but also teaches us something about the true nature of what intelligence actually is. Um, for a long time, Gibbons were considered to be um, less intelligent than other um, uh, what are considered to be higher apes, us and, and chimpanzees and gorillas and other ones, they seem to belong close to us. They were, they're quite close relatives. But they refused utterly to, to do things that the other apes, including us, would do, like use tools to get food. So a standard test would be put some sticks on the ground, put some food over there. And, you know, small children, apes, um, gorillas would grab the stick, get the thing, and it's like, OK, you're smart in that particular way. Gibbons would always refuse to do this. And, and a number of other tests. And so for years, they were sort of classified as having less intelligence than other, other creatures. Um, until eventually, someone redesigned this experiment. Uh, and what they did was that they hung the sticks from the top of the enclosure um, so that, um, uh, yeah, in, in, with the idea that this might re better represent the gibbons' natural environment. And indeed, it did, because immediately the gibbons just went, oh. And in that moment, after 20 years of experiments, uh, the gibbons sort of became intelligent. Um, of course, they'd been intelligent all along, right? It was us who were being dumb um, and keeping them in cages and a bunch of other things that were probably discouraging them from showing us uh, how smart they were all along. Um, but what, what this, this teaches, apart from our own dumbness, is that intelligence is something embodied. Um, intelligence isn't something that just exists in the head. Um, it's something that's related to your, your embodiment. Um, gibbons are brachiators, which means they spend most of their time up in the trees. So their, their body plan, their awareness is kind of directed upwards. Um, they have a different experience of the world that relates to how they do intelligence. And this is the other part. Intelligence is embodied, and it's also something we do, not just something we have. That's why IQ tests are completely rubbish. Um, because the intelligence is, the, is about your... Uh, about your body and the relationships that you have. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's embodied and it's relational. And it matters, the experiences you've had um, uh, and, the, um, and, and the way in which you experience the world. And once you understand that, you can start to see how other creatures, other beings embodied differently to ours, do intelligence in ways that matter to them. Um, uh, and, and that, in fact, there are many, 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 if not infinite ways of doing intelligence. Um, these guys are having a bit of a moment at the moment. Uh, a lot of you have probably seen that film. Um, uh, but it's really, really important to talk about why octopuses are such a like, uh, uh, really good example of what I'm talking about. Um, so octopuses are, like, on the surface, and the cephalopods in general, um, about as kind of different to us as one could possibly imagine. And in terms of their experience of the world, um, that they live quite short lives, mostly underwater, uh, in these, in, you know, totally radically different conditions. And yet we have these surprising things in common. In fact, they're better than us at several things. Um, uh, they're very good at problem solving. Uh, they can plan ahead. Uh, they, they make plans to escape when we imprison them, for example, and they're quite successful at escaping. Um, they're, uh, they're very good at facial recognition. Um, they can recognize individual humans, which humans can't recognize individual octopuses. Um, and they know which ones they like and dislike and treat them differently. Um, uh, and uh, they have these amazing eyes, which we also have. Uh, so the, the um, octopus eye is, is very, very similar to ours. It's a, a kind of gel-filled little... Um, in a sphere with an iris and a cornea. Um, and it's actually better than ours in a certain way because the way that the optic nerve connects at the back means that it doesn't have the little like, blind spot that we have. Um, uh, and they have, they have full, they have, you know, complete vision. And what's really fascinating about that is that um, 
Like, we're, we're so different from the octopus. Uh, and in fact, like, if you were to look back through the like, evolutionary history, we're like at least 600 million years from our last common ancestor. Because we did all come from the same place at some point. Uh, but that 600 million year old ancestor was probably some kind of little blind flatworm living on the bottom of the ocean. And so this eye, this eye came up to separate, came somewhere later within this kind of expansionary evolution. And we're actually like 1,200 million years, if you think. You have to go 600 million years down one side, 1,200 million years up the other side of the evolution, yet we both have the eye. And we're both intelligent. And so intelligence has evolved, not once, at least twice, and probably as many, many times as there are creatures on this planet. Because it's really important to remember that in the words of Lynn Margulis, the evolutionary biologist, everything is equally evolved. Everything on this planet has been evolving for the same amount of time. Nothing is more evolved than anything else. And nothing is more intelligent than everything else. Everything is differently intelligent according to the ways that it has evolved. But it is multiple intelligence. And intelligence, rather than being this like upward thing towards you know, us, basically, <laughs> sat at the top of the tree looking down on everyone else, it's this kind of vast cloud or network in which intelligence has flowered in all these different ways all over the place. And the, intelli and the intelligence of the octopus is even more radically different than ours because its, its neurons extend out through its body and half of its brains are actually in its arms and they appear to operate occasionally independently from the rest of its body and are capable of doing things that the central mind isn't even thinking about. And so they represent an entirely different way of, of being embodied in intelligence and so much more and we are only beginning to understand how much of the world is actually like that. And then there's plants. Um, a few years ago, researchers put... Um, they recorded the sound of um, caterpillars eating the leaves of cress plants. And then they took the caterpillars away and they played the, um, uh, the plants back, the sounds of the caterpillars munching on the leaves. And they discovered that the plants immediately flooded their leaves with the same chemical defense as they do when they're eaten by actual caterpillars. And you're like, oh, plants can hear. That's interesting. Uh, we didn't know that before. Um, uh, at least, you know, uh, we didn't have quite such powerful proof of it. Um, and then a few years ago, uh, in some other experiments, someone did this, uh, a researcher called Monica Galliano did this really beautiful series of experiments where she took mimosa plants. If you don't know the mimosa, it has these really fine, beautiful leaves that when you touch them, it curls up instantly. It's one of the few plants that you can see react in human scale time. Um, and what, what her team did was they, they put these plants on a little rail so they could just drop them like 10 centimeters onto a pad, just enough to trigger that response. Went, and the plants would curl up. But they discovered after three, four, five drops, plants would stop curling up. And um, I thought, okay. Um, they, they, they took them somewhere else, they like poked them, they curled up. They kind of blew them with wind. They curled up, dropped them again, didn't curl up. Plant learned. <laughs> they tested them weeks, months later, they remembered. <laughs> Plants learn and remember, and they can hear. Uh, they have proprioception, they can uh, sense things around their bodies. Uh, they can possibly make some kind of planning. They can certainly change plan based on the behavior of other organisms around them. In short, plants, basically do a bunch of the things that in animals we consider to be intelligent in various ways. And we have no idea what the mechanisms for this are. No idea. Uh, we don't know how they're hearing or doing any of that other stuff. Um, so again, we're just really at the threshold of um, understanding the capabilities of other beings. But what I enjoy about these stories is this realization that when you stop asking, like, how much are you like me? when it comes to things like intelligence, and you start instead asking like, what it is like to be you, all these amazing behaviors, abilities, kind of spring into being. Um, I want to give a nice example, a slightly deeper example of um, one of these kind of amazing abilities. Um, this, is, um, this is our friend, the slime mold. Um, if you spend any time in kind of woods, foresty bits, um, and you should, uh, you can find an infinite number of varieties of these creatures living on kind of dead, wet wood. Um, no one's really sure what they are. 
<laughs> like, like scientifically, um, they are themselves, um, but they don't really seem to fit inside like the categories fungi, algae, etc. In fact, nothing does anymore. All that species stuff, rubbish. Um, but um, they really kind of trouble it, and they also trouble the distinctions between like individual and community in really interesting ways, because some of the time they're like these just big kind of sacks of free-moving nuclei within kind of a protoplasm, and sometimes they turn into cells and turn into fruiting bodies, and some of them go off and spore, and some of them die. Um, and it's not clear how they decide how to do that or anything else that they do, but they do it. Um, one of the things they are good at is finding really efficient routes between things, because um, they have quite scarce food sources. And so a few years ago, some researchers at the University of Tokyo um, used oat flakes, which uh, this particular slime mold, Polycephalum fazarum, likes to eat. And it placed them on a little thing that represented a map of the Tokyo Bay area. Um, and they let the slime mold do its thing. Uh, they also shone some lights in various places to like, be rivers and mountains and stuff, because they don't like bright lights. And within 24 hours, the slime mold had recreated the map of the Tokyo metro. Um, which is as close as you can get to like an efficient routing between these, uh, between these various spots and something that obviously took some of the best railway engineers uh, in the world kind of 100 years to do. Um, it was good work too. Um, uh, so it, it really likes making these kind of little maps and it's a very nice little party piece. Um, but it also belies like just quite how smart it is. Um, there's a problem in mathematics called the travelling salesman problem, um, which is... Basically, given five cities, what's the shortest route between all of those cities, visiting, only, visiting each one only once? Right? You can understand why this is interesting mathematically and also commercially to like a bunch of companies and stuff. Turns out to be incredibly hard, uh, what's called exponentially hard. Because like for five cities, you've got five times four times three times two times one possible routes, which is a lot. Um, but if you add another city, uh, it's six times five times four times three times two times one routes, right? And so the graph of the time that's needed to solve that problem goes like this, <laughs> which is the kind of problem that like we and machines, computers, actually hate, right? <laughs> like we, um, because it doesn't matter how much like thinking you throw at it, it's just always going to be that hard. There's no like shortcut to going the answer. There's no magical formula. Apart from, from slime molds, apparently, who are capable of solving the traveling salesman problem in linear time, which means the, it, the graph for them solving the problem just looks like that. And again, we have no idea how they do this, but they're better at the, solving this particular type of mathematical problem, not just than humans, but than the most powerful supercomputers that humans have ever built. And we have no idea how they're doing that, how they're like, coordinating that awareness. Right? Like what's going on? Because these are unicellular creatures. They're basically amoebae. Um, we have no access. And the other thing is, it's, it's like it's not that hard for them. Uh, it's just what they do, right? And I like to think that they also probably do a lot of really other completely amazing things that we don't even like know how to frame the questions for, because they are so like sort of radically different to us. And so. The reason I'm interested in going back and forth between these two different types of intelligence is I think there's always something to learn from kind of both sides of this question. And my example of that is this. Um, in the last few decades or so, there's been a growing awareness of, spurred by some you know, really astonishing scientific research, of the amount of communication that is occurring at all times within the non-human world. And a wonderful example of that is um, the fungal networks undergird the Earth in general, but particularly what are called uh, mycorrhizal networks. And these are uh, pathways of funguses that run from and within the roots of trees to other trees. And in, in healthy forests, um, that the entire forest is undergirded with these, these, these mycorrhizal networks. Um, and those, those networks transmit um, information, so if one tree is attra attacked by bugs or whatever, it will tell the other trees, it warns them through the mycorrhizal networks, and the other trees will start producing deterrents. Um, there's also a, a nutrient pathway. So when the like, summer trees are in bloom, they send nutrients to the trees in the shade, even if they're different species. And, and that's, those are sent back in wintertime when the broadleaf trees drop their leaves. 
And so there's this constant kind of back and forth, this amazing, extraordinary thing going on in the forest. And again, we've only just started to learn about it in recent years. And it's really, it's really amazing that when this research was first published in, in Nature in the 1980s, um, uh, they chose to use as the title... Uh, actually, it wasn't the 80s, it was the early 90s. They chose to use as the title of that issue of Nature. They called it the Wood Wide Web. Um, because even though, and it's really important to stress, the, the, they're not the same kind of networks, uh, they, 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 they function differently. They understood that people would have an image of what this looked like based on that notion of the internet. And in fact, of course, so did the scientists making it, because those scientists who first started studying these underground networks were also some of the first people to be connected to the nascent internet, because academic institutions were some of the first places to be connected to the internet. So they were the first people to be given this um, kind of mental model of networks that they could then apply to the things under the ground. And that happened, it kind of happened a second time as well, because it turned out that when people were studying the internet itself in the 1990s, this, this thing that we kind of built without really meaning to, like it, it kind of grew without a centralized plan, and no one really knew what they were building. Um, and it turned out to be a new kind of network, what, what became known as a scale-free network, because it sort of grows in odd ways, and you can take bits out and put them back. And it, um, it didn't, uh, none of the old mathematics of network worked on it, so they had to come up with a new type of mathematics called network theory, which it then turned out to be the best way of explaining how um, stuff worked in the mycorrhizal networks. Right? That mathematics also applied to the mycorrhizal networks. So at the same time, we were building this like, human interconnected network that was allowing us to see for the first time the non-human interconnected network that was already exist to study it better. And there's something so weird that I find so fascinating in that, that we as, um, as humans, as mostly incredibly um, solipsistic, like blind creatures, need to make these kind of weird toy versions of the world before we are capable of seeing in the world something that's already happening there. And I get the feeling that maybe that's happening with AI in the present moment, that there's something kind of compelling us to make these like crap, weird little pocket intelligences, just in the hope that we'll finally open our eyes to like all the other intelligences that have been here with us all along. And I think that's just an ongoing kind of mental process that probably happens in all kinds of ways, all kinds of time. Um, I've got... Um, a little bit more time left. Uh, so I'm going to go into the second half of this, which will be a bit shorter, uh, which is also to look, at, to look back at that kind of technology and explore it a little bit differently. Now that I've said, here is like, the problems with contemporary AI, and here's like, a whole bunch of way more interesting stuff. What could we, happens if we bring those two ideas together a little bit? Um, because I explained at the beginning all these problems with this idea of computational thinking, of, of thinking like a machine, of, of, of thinking in all of these kind of binary terms that we do because we're so like, amazed by the power of computers. Um, it's really, really important to stress that um, all 99.9999% all of computers in the world, like this one, the one in your pocket, your laptop, the ATM, the one that flies the plane, the ones that runs the financial system, all of them are one type of computer. Right? They're just one kind of possible computer. And that is the kind of computer that was laid down theoretically in the 1940s by Alan Turing. Um, it's called the Turing machine. Um, and Turing defined this incredibly powerful thing. It's what's called the universal Turing machine. Um, and, and this is a Turing machine, and they're all Turing machines. Um, and he described this imaginary thing, which was just a, a read-write head, like in a tape player, and a strip of paper. And, and the read-write head can like, read a symbol, write a symbol, ones and zeros, onto a strip of paper. The strip of paper moves back and forth. It does that. Da -da 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 -da. And that, that strip of paper and that tape head, that's all computers. Right? <laughs> it can do anything that all of our computers can do. It'll take a bit longer, but it can do the same operations because it's the universal Turing machine. And that's what we've based all of the computers we've built on ever since. And it's a very powerful thing, and it's also at the scale of the universe, as I've said, incredibly limited. Um, and what's really interesting is that if you go back um, into Turing's uh, original papers, it's like the first couple of papers he writes about the, what he was then calling the automatic machine, 
right? And that's key as well, because what we call the Turing machine, he called the automatic machine, because it would only do whatever you told it to do. That was his definition of it. It would only like step one step at a time through things that you told it to do. Um, he said, oh, but by the way, there is another kind of machine possible, and he called it the oracle machine. And then he doesn't say anything else about it, uh, apart from a footnote. And in the footnote, he says, <laughs> we won't go any further into it. It's just not a machine. And you're like, what are you talking about, Alan? <laughs> like, give us a clue. Um, uh, but he, 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 he did refer to it like kind of a couple of papers kind of 20 years later. And people have talked about it a little bit since. But right, right at the beginning of all of, of computation is that, like, this hint, this truffle scent, that there's like a totally different way of doing it, which is that the computer would talk to the world. The oracle in Turing's imagination was a connection to the rest of the world. Um, the automatic machine, as I say, would only run on the steps that you gave it, like classic algorithm, step one, step two, step three, finish. The oracle would stop and like look into the world, pay attention to it, learn something, come back and do the rest of the computation. Fundamental difference to these kind of closed little boxes that we type into all day. Um, and throughout history, like, people have tried to build versions of the Oracle machine. Um, this amazing guy called Stafford Beer, um, who was a British cybernetician in the 1960s and uh, 70s, 50s, in fact, um, uh, who was uh, tasked by US Steel with making, um, uh, uh, with automating their factories. They were the biggest steel manufacturer at the time. Uh, and everyone, it was back in the 50s, everyone knew computers were coming, automation was going to happen. Uh, Everything They thought the same thing about automation. It would take everyone's jobs. Uh, they were US Steel, so they thought that was a good thing. Um, they asked Beer to figure it out. And Beer was like, this is interesting, but if we just put like automatic machines, these computers in there, like the factory will die, right? Uh, he had this really horrible term for it. He called it a spineless dog. Because um, he basically said it was like an organism without a nervous system. Because it couldn't sense the environment around it, it would die. Um, and so what he designed was what he called the cybernetic factory uh, that looked like this. And no one understands this diagram. Um, <laughs> but what, what they were, like, it's got feelings. And, and, and so the, I do know what homeostat is, but I'm not going to go into it. But anyway, um, but, but his idea was that you, what you need to do is you need to have this big automated system, but you needed some kind of intelligence at the, at the center of it. And what he understood was that intelligence was a thing that, that lived, that did things. And so he thought it needed some kind of biological system Oh, why does that stop working? Doesn't matter. Um, and so at the start, he really tried to do the whole thing with mice and cheese. Uh, and he like diagrammed up systems with little pulleys and stuff like this. And had, had um, uh, the, it didn't really work. He tried it with pigeons. He tried it with children as well. He, he trained his own children to solve, uh, to solve really complex equations, despite having no knowledge of math, just by pressing different buttons. Weird guy. Um, but eventually, what he, what he did was he built in the basement of his... Um, a basement of his own house, he built a huge water tank. And he went out with a bucket and got buckets of water from nearby ponds. And he filled this tank with water. Because his idea was, like, instead of having a single organism trapped in there, what you should have is like a whole ecosystem. And what he wanted to do was set up a kind of system of communication between this ecosystem and this factory. And so first of all, he used these little creatures called Daphnia, which are like little water fleas. They're very light sensitive. They'll swim away from light. Um, and so he basically encoded the data from the factory as into lights, and then watched where the Daphnia went and fed the data from like, the Daphnia's movements back into the factory as a way of like, changing its settings. Like, as the situation in the world changed, the Daphnia would react. And he basically thought there'd be this kind of like, feedback loop between the ecological system and like, the financial system that will allow this, this uh, thing to self-stabilize. Um, uh, but the Daphnia... Um, uh, the Daphnia would just get bored after a while, basically, and who blames them, and stop reacting to the light. So he tried um, Euglena instead, um, and what he did with them, was, which is another kind of little water bug, uh, he fed them iron filings so that he could push them around with magnets, uh, but then they started all pooing out rust, so the whole system failed again. Anyway, um, this, this system, I don't know whether he ever presented this system to his bosses at US Steel, which is like, here, I'm replacing you with pond scum. Um, but uh, but it's, it's this beautiful vision of like connecting together um, ecological and and uh, border systems that is. I'm a few more. Um, 
that is exemplary of, of the real point that I want to make, which is that you can make computers out of anything, uh, including billiard balls. Um, uh, for example, um, this is a logic gate. Logic gates are the things at the heart of all computers that decide, um, like, ones and zeros, how do you process them? Um, imagine you have a billiard table and uh, it has two slides going down it and two pockets. And if you drop a ball down one slide, it goes into the pocket over there. And if you drop it down this slide, it goes into the pocket over there. But if you drop two in, they hit each other and they go into a different pocket. You've just done a sum, right? You've just done a bit of mathematics. And so with enough billiard tables, you can do any kind of computation you want to do, right? Um, that's called the billiard, body, body, billiard ball model of computation. Um, uh, and uh, you can do that with anything. In fact, you can do that with crabs. Um, because some researchers in Japan discovered that, uh, or noticed that uh, blue soldier crabs move in this very predictable ways. Uh, that at certain times of the year, they form into giant swarms and they move across the reefs in ways that are quite predictable, usually when they're scared by birds that they don't like, because uh, the birds are trying to eat them, and they'll set off. But then the swarms will like smash into each other and then roll off in different directions. Uh, so these researchers built a series of logic gates um, based on crab swarming. Uh, and they proved that you can uh, recreate uh, also any computer, a Turing computer, in fact, um, by uh, scaring the crabs with shadows that they think are birds and driving them through these little gates and so that you can make a computer entirely out of crabs. The reason for doing stupid stuff like this is that the thing I said at the beginning is the fact that we have this weird illusion that um, computers are... Uh, rather, the world is like a computer. We've fallen into this terrible fallacy that the world is somehow like a computer, that the world is modelable as ones and zeros in this binary way, and it's messing with our heads, and it's messing with the world. Um, and what I'm interested in, in part, is computers that are more like the world, rather than the other way around. Um, that we try to try to find ways of starting with computers as being like us, small models of aspects of the world, and then trying to bring them closer to the world. This is a, an example of a crab computer or something like it as well. This is a, the Moniac, which was built by Bill Phillips, an economist at the, at the LSE in the 1940s. Um, it's a water computer. Um, it, it's a computer, but it runs not on electrons, but on, on water. And there's a tank of water at the bottom, and there's um, um, pumps that take it up to the top, and then you've got um, kind of various labels, uh, various uh, taps and stuff labeled things like income tax, VAT, in uh, uh, exports, imports, and then the buckets at the bottom are like national income, personal savings. It's a model of the British economy uh, that uses water. Um, it retains all those kind of lovely metaphors of like fluidity, and um, uh, uh, and it turned out to be so good at modeling the British economy that the British government built like another five of them and used it them to actually set economic policy. Um, because it turned out water, the fluidity of it, the fact that it was made of the world, was actually made it better at calculating real world things. And there's loads of really nice examples of them. The Soviets built loads of these in the 1960s and 70s for doing also similar real world tasks. That much of the world, when you get right down into it, is not amenable to computation. And this has nice side benefits as well to digital computation. That this um, has, um, like, you can go to the Science Museum in London, and, and there's examples elsewhere, and see this thing. And you really understand that by, when you're working with it, you, have an un you are closer to the world yourself. You're not abstracted from it like you are when we use so much of our technology today. It changes your fundamental relationship to it. Very last example, because um, I want to give a, a real-world example right now of where this kind of like AI ecological stuff is coming together, and I'll stop because um, it's got goats, and they're my favourite. Um, there's an amazing program based out of one of the Max Planck Institutes in Germany called Icarus, uh, which does animal sensing. I'm really super interested in um, what's increasingly becoming called the Internet of Animals which is the, our ability to sense like, the actual behavior of billions of animals on a much fine-grained level. comes with a bunch of questions, too, obviously. Um, what they did in this... So a few years ago, the, the Icarus um, uh, people, they managed to get an, an antenna installed on the ISS. Uh, the Russians stuck it on the outside of the ISS, which can pick up these like, very fine-grained signals from animal tags. Uh, and they put accelerometers 
on a whole bunch of sheep, cows, goats, dogs, in a couple of places in Italy, in, uh, on the slopes of Mount Etna and in a village called L'Aquila in central Italy. Uh, so they could basically see how much the animals were moving around. Uh, and what they were looking for was earthquakes. Um, because it's been like attested by folk knowledge for, for centuries that um, animals behave weirdly around earthquakes, and no one knows how or why they're doing it. Um, but um, uh, you know, a, a couple of months after they'd installed uh, this antenna, um, there were earthquakes. And they were able to look back through the data and see the way in which the animal's behavior had changed running up to the earthquake. And they saw that different animals like, changed their behaviors and the way they moved around and their activity like, differently by species at different times in approaching this earthquake. But as a result, they were capable of basically making a new kind of earthquake detector that's more uh, advanced, gives them far more warning uh, hours ahead of any previous technique we've had for predicting earthquake that will save whatever lives. And, you know, it's just an incredibly powerful thing by, by listening to the animals, or rather by like, having an AI listen to these animals, in fact, because the data, to see those patterns in the data is very complicated, like humans can't do it. But it's very specifically the kind of like, number crunching problem that AI, or what we call AI, is actually really good at. And brilliantly, what they used was um, uh, a bunch of like, machine learning algorithms that had been developed for um, financial systems, right? that have been designed for like, day trading on the stock market. So exactly those kind of like, really predatory, um, uh, extractive, profit-seeking algorithms that I described at the beginning. But here they were just listening to the goats. And I love that I kind of had this imagine of like, it's like, like you know, um, penitent bankers like retiring to the country to like do good. Um, and we just like, we've just put the goats and the AI in conversation and have learned like this incredible thing. And we don't understand, like we don't understand how animals predict earthquakes, but they're clearly doing it. And so instead of doing the old school, which has its benefits or reasons, scientific thing of basically cutting the animals up into tiny parts and examining their brains to try and, you know, and killing them in the process in order to understand how they do it, we've just listened to them and let them teach us. And there's something for me quite sort of magical in that. Um, and I think that's probably where I'll stop, um, because I've told enough stories about intelligence. I know I, for now, and I look forward to more conversations. Thank you very much. It's, it's a joy to listen to it. And, and, and I think, well, the goats is, are, 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 you s immediately feel that you have to l look differently to the goats. But Always. You must live a really rich life now. Everywhere you, you see this intelligence, when you walk through a city or are in nature, how yeah, does it mean, really exp change your experience of everything? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's there for everyone. It's just outdoors. Descri um, describe your day. Your, your <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I go up, I talk to the plants, uh, <laughs> see how they're doing. Yeah. Um, though, I mean, Have they names, it, the plants? Some of them do. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's, been a, it's, it's been a really interesting thing for me um, because, you know, I was a hardcore city dweller for almost 40 years in various large cities. Um, and it's, it, like, it was only when I started to become interested in some of these questions that through another series of accidents I spent, found myself spending more time in what, for want of a better word, we call nature. Um, and, um, and it was a revelation to me. And I don't want to romanticize like, non-urban life because this, this experience can happen in urban life as well. But all it requires is like attention. Um, all, it, all it requires is just paying attention to the world around it and listening to it speak and shutting up for a while and, and, it, and, it, and it comes right up to you. Yeah. I have this tree that I always say hello to on the new markets. That's my friend. And I've, I feel when I touch it, it will... But it, funny enough, it's, it's been made ridiculous because of a princess here who is cuddling trees and then everybody was making fo uh, uh, jokes about it. Everyone makes jokes about tree hugging, but tree hugging really matters. Yeah. Um, like, and I can tell you a bunch of reasons why. I can tell you that like, your heart is actually composed of a number of kind of neurons that vibrate at the same frequency as the phylum moving through the, the so bark again, of the tree. Sorry, that, that you have to say again. <laughs> the, 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 your heart, there are neurons in your heart that like, uh, are related to the mirror neurons in your brain that you may have heard about that vibrate at the certain frequencies which mirror the frequencies of the, the juices that flow through the tree. And I could tell you that by you know, breathing close to a tree, you're inviting new bugs into your microbiome. 
that are like making you more healthy and intelligent by doing so, and all those things are scientifically true. And I can also just tell you that making, hugging a tree is a good thing to do because a plant is a good spirit and it will love you back. <laughs> exactly. Both are true. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, what we're going to do now is to, 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 you, to ask you to stay here on the on the on the uh, on stage, yeah. take yeah. us here, and I want to introduce you three people that we asked to uh, to join us in the panel. And we will ask them to first react on, on James. And then they also brought one example of what they are looking into in their own work uh, and fields. And then we are going to discuss that and see how it's, it will become more and more complicated. Uh, but I think this is, um, well, maybe not complicated, actually. It's very strange when you look at, if you think about more intelligences, then somewhere something makes sense. So it's, it's very strange thing that would make it more complex, so then something also makes sense in the world. So let's try to see if we can f f find that moment that we all think it makes sense, what we're discussing here today. Um, let me introduce you to Umama Hashri. Please come to the stage. Uh, Umama, Umama is research and lecturer at the Rotterdam University of Applied Sciences and her work focuses on the intersection of AI, ethics, and society. Uh, and she's currently part of the first cohort of the master's studies at AI, ethics, and society of the University of Cambridge, where she conducts research on the social impact of AI, mainly focusing on decolonization and demystification. So the demystification we have already, now you can also uh, tell a bit more later on decolonization. Uh, Spela Petrich, please come to the stage. Uh, Spela uh, is uh, a Ljubljana and Amsterdam-based uh, artist, trained in the natural sciences and holds a PhD in biology. And I think it's interesting you have a science and arts combination and also, James, you also have an art practice. So it's interesting that we, arts here is really well uh, on stage at the moment. Um, your work, uh, um, the Spela's artistic practice combines the natural sciences with bio, biomedia practices, performances, and critical examines the limits of our human-centered worldview. And the installation you have maybe been able to see and later on uh, is, is on stage. It's um, a cucumber plant. You will tell a bit more about that, who plays with AI. Um, and so this is the this is not the goat with the AI, but the cucumber plant with the AI here. Um, and then uh, as last, Chris uh, Julien, science philosopher. <laughs> Uh, Chris is doing a PhD at the University of Utrecht, uh, titled The Ecological Governance, Deep Adaptation Machines. He's active for Extinction Rebellion in the Netherlands. I think maybe you have seen when he was slapped away and telling us what is at stake. I think you're all trained to do that when they're they put you away, the camera is on you, and you still keep on saying the, the message. I, I, I keep on dreaming it even, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, please take the microphones. Oh, yeah. Can you give them to them? Great. Um, Chris is also a, 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 co a colleague of me, me at Dwaag, um, and Speel is also an artist in residence at Dwaag, so we uh, thank you for being here. Maybe first, if you, because uh, uh, it's a very rich presentation, uh, what for you is uh, c comes to mind when you want to react to to the to, to, re to James? Yeah. Well, well, thanks first of all for an inspiring and, and illuminating talk. I. I, I I deal with many of the same topics, but I think the way you narrate it and bring it all to life together, also in relation to computation, is downright inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, for me, what you are also gesturing towards from maybe a slightly more scientific perspective, I'm sort of a philosopher of science, um, is something quite revolutionary, I think, which is this relational idea about how the world works, this renegotiation of what causality is, no more billiard balls bouncing into each other, but these far more complex and maybe even intraactive relationships, you know? So from quantum physics to biology and ecosystems, we understand that the world is so much more complex and beautiful than we experienced before. And even though that is scientifically becoming something we know, culturally, especially for those in the West, it is something deeply alien maybe, and even something you can get angry or upset about. So bringing that in a, in a uh, upbeat way, I think, is a really important uh, message. But it also always makes me realize how, uh, to close, 
we are only now catching up to types of knowledge that were out there before the modern time, right? And sort of this complex relational mesh of life, which we are part of, the kinship that that involves, that other cultures have known for thousands of years, and we kind of chose to forget just over the past few centuries is something I find deeply hopeful for our time. Yeah, I mean, th things are moving, hopefully. But it's, it's really notable, like, even within the dominant scientific kind of discourse, how, like, backward and how, how little that leaks out in society. Because we consider ourselves, or society presents itself as being this kind of rational kind of thing, whatever. But it's like it's over 100 years since, like, the basic principles of quantum physics were established. So even within the dominant framework, we've had this, like, realization that shattered everything, and yet it hasn't, like, shattered anything at all. And we're still going on pretending like a Newtonian universe is okay. Um, it takes a while. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. I'm really happy to see so many people taking a look at non-human agencies from so many different points of departure and perspectives. And maybe just to say that um, also in my process, I'm continually uh, researching and going further. So it's really a pleasure to see sort of you address this topic um, and the shift that has happened between the previous book, uh, like the new dark age. And so this is like a much more hopeful, I would say, um, approach. Yeah. <laughs> Some people have read new dark age then. They know what that was like. Um, yeah. Well, I've, I've made so many notes, I'm not sure where to begin or where to start. <laughs> uh, I love the fact how you describe that we're seeing the world as a program and, you know, the false promise of enlightenment. And I really think that nowadays, when we're using our technologies, we're basically using them as instruments of knowledge magnification. Um, literally, our, our richest sources are data sets. We're trying to classify everything and categorize everything. and. I really think that this mechanization of our worldview is truly catastrophic. Um, you know, because there is no such thing, I would say, as, as being anymore. Um, rather, everything is, everything and everyone is a data point in our society nowadays. And, and that is just something that is really scary, I would say. So thank you so much. That was really enriching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I want to, to add on that. I think it's, it's for, for us some, it's hopeful because not just bashing big tech and discussing the problematic where we are in, it's, it's more fundamental, it's about the assumptions. And then when you discuss the assumptions, then we might open up new alleys to think about what other futures could be, or other ways to, to deal with what artificial, artificial intelligence can bring to us instead of this dystopian process where we're in at the moment. Where, where it's where, but. Are you, are you a little bit optimistic about that? Or, do, or is this really like, is this a real, do we feel that we're making a real impact here? Or is it really just the beginning? Because I think it, we are in a catastrophic field at the moment. It's, it's in all, all kinds of ways. So this is a little bit hopeful, but I want to also ask you, but also James, how you think about it. Or could we become more hopeful? Um, my, my feeling about, I, I, I am definitely, the, this work that I'm currently engaged in definitely has a sunnier feel to it, but I, I try to avoid terms like optimism and pessimism, or, or even like hope, uh, just from the perspective that like um, like that feeling alone is that's just the colour on top. What matters is what actually can be done, and and for me, like hope needs like a place to perch. Um, it needs to be rooted on some kind of foundation of like potential change, uh, which is. You know what I usually talk about when I talk about agency, that like one needs some kind of like fundamental understanding of of the the system that we're dealing with that we can then work with, uh, and the feeling of hope comes from having like a handle on it, and that can come from having like some kind of particular type of knowledge or some kind of particular type of skill that allows you to actually act in the present moment with, and, and no longer feel kind of like helpless in response to it. So it's not really about just that kind of sunny optimism. It's like, well, what are the, what are the pieces of knowledge? What are the skills? What are the, the, the modes of discourse we need amongst ourselves, the forms of community we need to make so that we can actually take concrete kind of actionable steps? Um, and that's, yeah, I'd like to go about thinking about how we build those. Yeah. Maybe, um, Unaman, you brought a, a, a slide which you then maybe can can introduce to us would you like to do that now yes. yeah i can i will do the slide and then you can explain us what we're seeing how it relates for you yeah you can 
Um, yeah, so basically this image uh, portrays a German racial anthropologist uh, who worked for a project in Nazi Germany, um, which was composed of scholars who fostered the idea that German people descended from the so-called Aryan race, uh, which they believed were superior to other racial groups. And on this image, you can see him measuring um, the head or the face of a woman from Tibet um, to actually prove and demonstrate what he believed were the inferior characteristics of human race. And the idea of measuring or quantifying intelligence is fundamentally rooted in eugenics, one could say, which is the immoral theory of racial improvement in which they not only believe that they could enhance human beings, but actually also eliminate these social ills. And, you know, this theory which gained a lot of popularity, um, especially in the beginning of the 20th century, unfortunately not only legitimized ideas of racial hierarchy, um, but even justified horrors such as enslavement and coloniality and empires. And I've chosen this pretty much disturbing image to display the complex um, yet very strong link between technology, science, and Western empires, because this complex link also helps us to critically assess the AI systems and the AI technologies that we are using nowadays. Because, you know, we can ask ourselves the question, what is our understanding of intelligence? What are the values that we think are inherent to intelligence? Uh, and how are these translated in these technologies that we are building and developing and using on a daily basis? And, you know, it's also frequently stated that the, um, that the humanity has developed rapidly after the scientific revolution um, due to Western science, but it's often neglected how this European scientific success was basically based on the sacking of colonizing people. And it was built on a system that exploited billions of people, but also their knowledge systems, leading to this Eurocentric point of view of science um, that we heavily rely on nowadays and consider as the only or as the legitimate source for our cultures and our values and our epistemologies. And you know, even if we look at it from, if we counter it from an AI perspective, this is also translated in the environmental impacts when we look at the AI asymmetries that are at stake, for example, the fact that um, countries in the global south are feeling the ripple effect of climate change more than countries here in the global north, uh, or even the psychological impact, you know? Uh, there is a lot of ghost work and hidden labor that we depend on for these AI systems to be able to operate, which is also situated in these countries. And, you know, basically what I'm trying to say here is that this Eurocentric point of view of science and the specifically the lack of consideration of other knowledge systems, cultures, values, epistemologies, ethical frameworks even, they are all reflected in our technologies that we're using nowadays. And this individualistic and capitalistic um, West has much to learn from the same systems in which it has carried out these scientific con conquests uh, by documenting all their knowledge that they could find there. Um, you know, I would really say that there is a strong need for a coexistence or maybe even a coexistence among different knowledge systems. So think, for example, of African philosophy, Ubuntu, um, which focuses on the relationality between humans, non-humans, and nature, or Chinese Confucianism, which holds that the earth is also a being, is also alive. Or for example, Islamic philosophy, which emphasizes on the intelligence of non-human beings by, for example, that stating that plants are intelligent and that we should love them and that we should treat them with care or that animals are really smart. Just look at, for example, how camels are surviving in, in the desert, um, you know, where most large creatures or even humans wouldn't even be able to survive. And, you know, as, as James mentioned, and I loved it, you know, we live in a world of multiple forms of intelligence, of multiple ways of, of being. And as my work focuses on the decolonization and the deconstruction of AI, I really think it's important that 
we question ourselves which knowledge systems are we using when we are assessing intelligence, when we are building these systems. And, you know, we should really stop disregarding uh, other knowledge systems that are outside of our Western realm. Because I do agree that, indeed, our understanding of intelligence uh, nowadays is only linked to humans. But I would even add maybe a very important layer that our understanding of intelligence nowadays is linked to a specific type of human. So just to finish, you know, ironically, the crucial developments that we're using nowadays in maths, science, technology can be attributed to many different knowledge systems around the world and outside of the Western realm. Uh, just Google the origins of the, world, of the word algorithm, which can be linked to al-Khawarizmi, and who is a Islamic scholar who basically had very important impacts within the Islamic golden age um, in terms of mathematics and all the technologies that we're using nowadays. Uh, and his name was later, or like, the, it was later la Latinized to algorithm from al-Khawarizmi. So European science and our knowledge systems in general is very much built nowadays on these scientific advantages of people around the world. Uh, and it's very important if we want to move away from this mechanistic worldview on the one hand, but also to move away from the fact that we should not link intelligence only to a certain type of, of beings, that we really should start by acknowledging the other existing knowledge systems in our world, uh, in which these relational values and um, relational way of thinking and epistemologies have been and continue to be promoted, continue to be existing. So, you know, this knowledge and this realization and the consciousness of the world around us is really already present in other knowledge systems. And the next step would really be to consider these knowledge systems and to actively, critically assess the technologies that we're using today by using their values, their epistemologies, and maybe even their cultures. Okay. Thank you very much. It's quite a disturbing image because this is what actually, this is, we think it's in the past, but this is what we're doing on a daily basis. And, and uh, yeah, would you like to respond to that, James? To that story? Um, I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> Clear and, 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 yeah, pretty solid statement. Um, the, 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 I mean, there's a, the, the example we were talking about just before of, um, like, it's not my job to just go, actually, everything's fine. Um, but an example that I really love is there's a, there's a, um, uh, uh, they're called Te Aurea Media in, in New Zealand, and they're a project that um, set out to um, build a translation, a uh, uh, a uh, transliteration system for Mar the Maori language. So they were a radio, they were originally a radio station in New Zealand that had spent um, decades uh, building this huge collection of audio in Maori, but they wanted to transcribe it, so they had a written record. And so that effectively they, they had to build their own kind of um, like uh, speech synthesis program, machine learning program to understand this language it didn't exist. Um, and what they did was, um, first of all, what they did was that they appealed to their community. So they asked, Maori language speakers to contribute um, uh, uh, samples of them reading stuff that they could train this model on. And, and this tiny team, like we did say, and it is true, I think you said the same thing, like it's incredibly hard for non-massive corporations to build stuff like this, but it is possible, and they did. And they built an incredibly good language transliteration system because of their community, right? Because their community were willing to give them all these speech samples. Um, but what, what happened next was super interesting as well, is that several big foreign companies of, uh, that were also working on systems like this came and started offering uh, some of the same volunteers money to contribute their voice samples, and those people refused uh, because they said, like, this is, this is a form of colonialism, again. Like, you're, you're going to take my voice sample, you're going to make a language model, and then you're going to sell it back to me. Uh, and we, I've seen you before. Um, and, and actually, that, that particular part of the process led to the original Terror Media working with various people to create a kind of new form of licensing Around, um, uh, around these kind of models that basically could only be used by other indigenous groups. And now they work with other, uh, they're working with language keepers in, in the US and I, I think with others to like do this within, uh, uh, within traditional knowledge keepers. Um, 
to basically develop their own kind of AI systems. And so they're, like, it's, it's really, really nice when that kind of stuff happens, but, but we know what the, what the dominant thing is. Would you like to respond? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a big statement and really important statement, so how to find an entry point. I mean, I think f for me, reflecting on like Western knowledge systems and epistemologies and then also looking at non-Western knowledge systems, you know, like the point, so just sort of aside from the colonialism and the history of violence that we really have to learn to start to think from and not think after as an addition to the way we look at Western history, I think that's that's crucial. but. What's, I mean, I agree, let's not be hopeful, but what's empowering or uh, energizing is how it allows us to see that we too, I say we uh, as, as Westerners, have a cosmology. We too have a mythology, even though we thought we were beyond all that, right? And I think learning from other cultures that are more, I think, honest about the way they situate themselves in the story about how the world is also allows us to see how our science is in a sense a story and how our mathematics is also a language telling a story. You know, it's a very effective and deadly one, uh, but nonetheless, it starts with that story. So I think when we talk about the um, efforts to make these scientific insights also become cultural insights, I really appreciate being able to reflect back on our own storytelling in that way. Yeah. It's this whole, whole, whole movement to, to go to the assumptions, to don't take what it is as for what it is, but to, to understand what what goes be, before that, also what shapes our own way. Like uh, you just you mentioned for just at the beginning, the model manipulating the world. Is what are what are our models that we use ourselves, which are inside of us, which are in inside of our learning systems, in inside of science, inside of also the cultural narratives that we have. Uh, it's it's quite a it's it's quite a, a gymnastic that you have to do to be able to. To let it go, to to understand that you have you have your own ideology, although you think you're beyond it. We're postmodern. We don't have it. We do have it in itself. That is a that is already a, a, an idea. I would like to to move on because there's so many people that might have questions. I understand, but I also would like to. I hope you're still also learning a lot. So maybe maybe that's for the moment to have this conversation. So I want to to ask uh, Spela, would you do your presentation? Yes. Thank you so much. I think I can add a little bit uh, to this discussion from an artistic perspective. So in 2014, I began looking into plant alterity. And although I wasn't concerned with questions of intelligence, I was trying to deconstruct some other oppressive legacies of European enlightenment, namely the hierarchical ordering of life, uh, which posed plants as opposite of what is considered the good life. Um, namely because um, they were dubbed to lack autonomy, rationality, interiority, and essence. And the lack of these qualities made them appear as this living material. And, of course, man, uh, with a capital M, was in the position um, to do as they will with them. And then within the um, opus Confronting vegetal otherness, I embarked on um, a series of experiments of intercognition with plants at different scales, creating a strange situations from very mundane processes, such as this performance, Gota Poesis, uh, on the left, the right, the left. Um, the photo, uh, this is the result of the 20 hour long performance. And I stood in front of uh, this field of grass, casting a shadow onto it. So I stood as still as possible. And with this action, I entered plant time in order to allow the process of biosemiosis uh, to actually have a visible effect on the grass. And that's also a little bit of a, I was acting the human, you know, embracing this anthropocentric demand for the plant to recognize me in a way that is recognizable to us as well. So the visible effect comes from um, the property of plants uh, in the growing in the shadow. They actually invest all their energy into growing tall and long to escape into the light rather than producing the green chlorophyll. So. The process of surrendering to the plant through this work, but also <coughs> through the others, provided me with a, another 
unusual insight um, because the the whole confronting vegetal otherness series was completed uh, just around the time that theorists uh, began to reflect on our position in regards to algorithmic technologies. And um, one of the really influential works was of Shushana Zubov, uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. And this one was really tellingly subtitled, The Fight for a Human Future at the Frontier of Power. And it became really clear to me that the operations, the algorithms were performing to make sense of our behavior. That means categorizing, making proxies, and predictions to subsequently manipulate people's actions were done uh, with the presumption that we as people can be legible in this manner. That we are also intelligible purely from the surface. So in other words, in the eyes of the algorithm, people are also plants. So this was a rather inspiring shift of perspective uh, because I could finally let go of the uncomfortable position that presumes plants needed to somehow be rescued from the background. And instead I used the algorithm's ontological flattening to consider a common plight, to see ourselves in relation to algorithms as members of the vegetariat. And if we think about it, plants in agriculture have been living under technological surveillance and control to a much greater extent than we have, right? So then uh, what followed uh, was another series of works titled The Plant Machine. And within the series I made, uh, or in, with collaborators among other works, Play, PL apostrophe AI, Plants and AI, Playing. And the documentation of this work you can uh, experience in the foyer. But it was actually an attempt to create an AI robot, a plant-centered AI robot that plays with cucumber plants. And I'm not talking about a game, but rather this ontological concept of playing where the play is expressed in the freedom of movement and this interaction, the exploration of the world. And so it, this work, uh, uh, is also challenging. Um, it insists on a non-utilitarian non AI whose goal escapes the epistemology of the science which created it. And finally, also, whether or not play takes place lies in the eye of the beholder. So to conclude, for me, rather than considering the breadth of intelligences out there, I would like to uh, see us push the envelope um, of other um, other phenomena. For example, a ubiquitous capacity for play, you know, and have that be the guiding principle for building relations within the world. Again, I think if you look at the, at the, 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 the um, in, in the foyer, you have this the cucumber plant, which has this. How we call this? The, the tentacle. This tendrils. Tendrils yeah. that that is sort of moving around, and and only that's to understand that as where does that come? Where does that movement come from? Is it and looking and searching for the little ball or the little thing to 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 hook onto? Uh, to me, that's in itself such a small thing of un trying to understand that is already so complicated. And it brings you in another position. Yeah, I mean, trying to understand it from a scientific perspective and in terms of the function, functionalist uh, perspective, like how does this happen? How does the plant sense? Um, I try to refocus uh, the perspective in terms of uh, questioning, well, you know, how do plants behave and where do they have uh, this freedom of for pure expression and where could we possibly encounter that and how could we do that right so it seemed like the tips of the plants the roots where it grows that that would be a good place to look and the roots are kind of like really hidden <laughs> and you don't want to disturb that so uh, that's why uh, you know uh, it was the tendrils that seemed to be like the place to look for play and that um, building a robot uh, actually makes sense, not as something that is autonomous uh, and, and uh, would be able to do this in the, like play with plants. So we have this fiction of 
uh, Earth without humans, but rather understand the robot as this technical tool that extends our capacities, right? And then, crucially, um, consider the limitations of AI, right? Or maybe not necessarily f face them, but also ask, are we, are we really pushing it as far as it can go? And that's where this play came in as a really good source of, of this constant slippage, right? And it took uh, two years of conversing with programmers. It was like a, a collective effort to uh, and saying no. As the first question was, okay, so we start, is, uh, we start with the question, is the plant okay? Yes, no, right? And immediately that sounds like such, such a wrong question to ask, but it really reveals this kind of binary logic or just the... A, a fixed category logic, whereas play is kind of the opposite, no? not a game, but play, yeah. Yeah, not competition, but yeah. Because there are so many things, I mean, everything should have its own, in its own right, a long discussion. <laughs> but could you, what is your reaction to this? Uh, it, it fits really well in your story that, um, sorry, sorry, James, in, in your story of, um, be, that it's an, um, that artific sorry, yeah, artificial intelligence is not that intelligent. It's very, it's very limited in a way. It's one of the m possible ways to, to deal with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I really love the the play project, uh, particularly because it's like this putting putting of like other intelligences in conversation with each other and kind of getting the hell out of the way, like with the goats. Um, very, so I, I love the, um, the this the the, the 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 durational work of like talking back to the plants. Like, I had an experience that was very akin to that uh, of kind of like that starts with a, an attempt to like experience what it is like not always like to be a plant but like to, to just to try and move oneself into like a different state of awareness which is why i started making time lapse films um you know just getting a little like dedicated camera pointing at the house plant and like leaving it there for like 24 hours and like for us nothing is happening and then you play the film back and it's like right, all of this stuff's going on and this is a really big deal now and you see them in all the nature documentaries and it does look amazing but the really key realization for me was that actually you can you can watch as many of them as you like like online or in nature documentaries but if you make them yourself something else happens entirely which is that you actually have embodied the awareness of how much time it took to make it and you understand it and experience it in a completely radically different way and what i realized was that i was i thought i was speeding up the plants movement but actually i was slowing myself down to their own time and that was like the fundamental difference that was really this really it really works it's just a really good technique as these kind of things are and um it's a uh, Darwin did it, uh, and I just bring it up because he, you, when you start talking about the tendrils, it reminded me. Uh, Darwin wrote a book with his, Charles Darwin wrote a book with his son Francis called The Power of Movement in Plants, Do you know, that contains, and they basically, they, they put plants in the, in the conservatory and then they hung big sheets of, because they didn't have cameras, they hung big sheets of glass next to them and they stood there for like hours, days at a time, like with a wax pencil, tracing the movement of the plant and the book's full of all these amazing diagrams they look like kind of aeronautical flights or something of the movement of the plants and the word for that thing that thing you were doing it's circumnutation is the um is the word for this type of movement and it's the most beautiful thing it's what all plants do every single seed if you watch it when it grows it does this like and it's the same thing that comes to and it's just like this beautiful sort of like hi world like, hi. Uh, and like yeah and you just start to see it everywhere and it's, it's gorgeous yes. I would love to give also you the floor, but I think we we now move to to uh, to you, uh, yep. Chris, and that will be the last little presentation we have. I follow tradition, and I understand because we we started late and we are running a bit late. So anybody who wants to leave here, of course, when you do it really quietly, you can do that because some people have to pick up kid children or whatever. Real life is happening outside of this space as well, so don't feel. That's not a problem because we started late. But uh, when you do it, please be quiet. Be a little bit quiet. Yes, Chris. Give me one click. I give you. I give you the click. There you are. Yeah, the first click. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to add to James's lovely talk a couple of thoughts on time and heat, given the times we live in. Um, first of all, this living world that we've been talking about in all its endless complexity. I just want to stress that we cannot understand that world without 
seeing the millions and millions of years that it took to evolve, to co-evolve, to tune into each other and to find all these rhythms and cycles of life as we know it now, right? So maybe in contrast to technologies as we know them, the, all this life we know is, is in, of an incredible durational character. And as we were just saying, um, in the past 500 years or so, modern science deemed it necessary to kind of wipe all this messy complexity uh, off the table in favor of a, a rational worldview and a worldview where linearity and controllable, predictable structures are kind of the way we want to interact with the world and the way we want to also uh, maybe conquer the world. And we, again, is a very uh, limited category in this case. Um, and literally in all the equations, the Newtonian, Schrödinger equations, all these physics of modernity, time does not play a role. It's literally not in the equation. So in the past couple of decades, complex system science has kind of brought time back into the picture. Um, and specifically, it's let us see how life is not a linear or predictable, predictable process, but rather living systems are far from equilibrium systems. And I find this a really fascinating fact. Um, so if the static image is, let's say, a very modern way of looking at the world, dicing it up into a grid, giving everything its point in the grid, its coordinate, in a moment we'll see what happens when living systems far from equilibrium move into time. The point of this far from equilibrium thing is that in the dead universe, so to speak, of physics, everything tends to average out. So celestial bodies just go round and round predictably. Heat dissipates evenly. If it's hot here and cold here, it'll move to equilibrium. Everything averages out. And in that, that universe, life is exceptional exactly because it's so far from equilibrium. And it's so from, far from equilibrium in these dynamic and balanced states, sitting in its niches, doing its thing, sitting kind of in its cup and kind of going around uh, being happy and being alive. And by now, Earth system science has taught us that not only is this the case for tiny cellular processes where biochemistry locks in the heat of dissipative systems and creates life on a cellular level, creates the energy for life on a cellular level, but also ecosystems and whole planetary systems are these non-linear and adaptive systems far from equilibrium, but still balanced in these nice cozy states that we can enjoy. So I guess we, then we can cue the image and let's say, think about what happens to these states, yeah. So you know, my body temperature is a far from equilibrium, but balanced system. So I'm plodding along in my life and everything's going well. My temperature goes up and down a little. It bounces back, but as complexity lessens, as my resilience lessens, suddenly the whole system can flip. And suddenly we also see where time emerges, both on the cellular level and on the planetary level. But because even Sisyphus couldn't roll that ball back into the cup. Once these processes occur, irreversibility occurs. And that's both in our living daily lives and also in the life of our planet. That there's these in complex and adaptive systems, there's these moments where a whole system can flip. And so my question for us all today uh, and, and in our lives is, that if we're stuck now in the middle of all of this, right? We are this ball bouncing about precariously on an edge in many ways. Uh, and that if we see that after 500 years of colonial and industrial technologies, of slave ships and steam engines, plantations and automation, all these balanced, delicate, far from equilib equilibrium systems have been cut through by these repetitive linear systems of technology and science. So fast and so hot, as James was also saying, that all these planetary systems we depend on are collapsing. So being stuck in the middle of all this collapse, I wonder, is it a hard problem of technology and life to understand how technology, these linear, controllable, predictable structures, can fit into these far from equilibrium, delicately balanced little cups and all the endless complexity of life that is almost unknowable in all its complexity, but nonetheless is all bound together to keep us in our beautiful little cups. Isn't it time to slow down technology? Isn't it time to make technology cool again? <laughs> Thank you.
If you can keep, keep it a little ever like this. There, so, so, so people get maybe very <laughs> worried every time something collapses or gets. <laughs> um, I think you're also pointing out that, that in, in understanding the world, we, we leave out certain elements like time, where we then sort of have not the right like, like instruments to really understand what's happening. Um, and I think the whole story today tells us that we, there are so many unknowns, there's so many things that we don't know, that we are assuming, and, then, and, and doing as if we can control the world, where, whereas we are in, in a situation that we have all this, um, all these uh, insecurities and, and un unknowns. Um, again, get James, this this idea of this tipping point. Uh, where are we in, in this in this in, at this moment? We're on the edge, right? I mean, like <laughs> I think that's fairly clear. Um, I, it was very lovely. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know if you tried to, to to that point, but uh, I, 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 it's definitely. Feels to me deeply resonant this this the, your image of the kind of the the complex tipping point because it seems that those those images of complexity and of the like the mattering of relations that that they emerge from um, seems to be like emerging in all of our kind of awarenesses and consciousness at precisely this moment which is because the universe is trying to tell us something quite important um, whether it's in you know the the so I mentioned cybernetics briefly earlier, which was very concerned with these questions of kind of complexity and control, which is also kind of returning to, the, to, to scientific discourse again in, in the same way that all scientific disciplines are starting to have, um, are, are starting to discover their ecology, by which I mean that like um, the ecological movement, which has moved through the sciences and, and through society over the last kind of 50 years, is a discovery of relationships. It's a realization that we're not in stable, siloed situations, but that everything is hitched to everything else and everything matters. Um, and that, that realization comes to kind of every discipline in time. Um, and it's coming and it's and it's coming to us as a um, it's coming to us as uh, as the West and the global north and, and our, to our dominant ideologies and it's coming to us as a species as we rediscover our, our interrelationships with everything else. Um, it's the it's the fundamental truth of the world. It's the quantum truth of the world as well. As I say, you can find a metaphor in any one of the buckets you go into. Um, that what matters is is relationships. Uh, that matters. Um, that what what exists as much as anything exists are the lines between things, not between them, uh, not not across them, but but um, you know between them. Um, and uh, and yeah. That's uh, that's where we're at, and what we're slowly coming to realise, and what we have to hold at the core of our practice uh, if we want to change our current behaviours. Yeah, these are great last words. But I also want to refer that, um, well, Maima, you, you you refer to some of the Ubuntu philosophy, like other philosophies, which are actually about relations. And, and so, th do you feel that we have that that there is enough attention at the moment? Which you, you're working in this field of AI and ethics and, and trying to bring this in. Do you feel that there's enough space for you to, 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 to for, for us, for all of us, to rethink uh, this area? Well, I think that the space is being created because the space was never there. So these people within these spaces have created the space for themselves. Uh, and there are a lot of like groups and, and institutes that are focusing on decolonial studies and looking at other epistemologies and other knowledge systems. Uh, so definitely, yes, I'm, I'm very optimistic. I'm very happy about that. I mean, it, it could be better, but it's a good start. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really terrible. I never, I, I didn't give any of you the, the words, but I, I thought it was, there were so many, so many intelligences here on stage that I really wanted to give them the floor. Uh, and there, is, there are drinks and I think there's a lot of ways to, 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 to make relationships there and to talk with each other. So thank you so much, uh, James, for, for your story. Okay. And Umaima, Shpela, and Chris, thank you so much. Thank you guys so much. And, uh, Yes, so this was this was the state of the internet 2023. I don't know what to do next year. This is really it was all all everything at the same time. Uh, thank you for being here, and uh, please uh, thank you for Single Uitgeverij, for ISDN, Gemeente Amsterdam, Groene Amsterdammer, and the OBA, of course. 
Uh, there's drinks, and uh, please also come to our program. Every first Thursday of the month, we have something special at the Waag. So please, hope to see you there again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.